Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Edison and Dr. M. Denton. Hello and welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. I am Josh Edison, locked down in Auckland, New Zealand. They are Dr. M. Denton, free as a bird in Zhuhai, China. And I suffering assume. from a case of deja vu. I feel like we've done this preamble before. Well, it's possible. We've been experimenting with different recording technologies this evening. Um, and also you were locked down last others. week as well. That's actually true. Yes, yes. No, the lockdown continues from where it was before. The case numbers continue to rise as we knew they would. Hopefully within about a week, they'll have plateaued and, and we won't be getting any more cases because everyone's being good little citizens and staying put. Um, but we will still have to wait and see, I think. Yes, this is one of these situations where I'm fairly sure things are working out because the case numbers are nowhere near as bad as I dreaded they might be. But I'm also very much aware that I am an epistemologist and not an epidemiologist, although I was mm. once referred to as an epidemiologist in a newspaper back home. So maybe I am both an epistemologist and an maybe epidemiologist. Maybe they're the same thing. Uh, but I, I, I am cautiously optimistic, which are, of course, famous words that I could live or die for mm. come next week. Yes, I think the, the telling thing at the moment seems to be that the rise has been kind of linear and not exponential, which is what you'd expect if the virus were free and wild in the population. So fingers crossed. I mean, it looks like we're definitely in for a bit more lockdown, at least in the North Island. Um, things might ease up a little bit down south, given that there have been no cases reported there. But yes, certainly I'm, didn't I'm probably they going to be... some COVID-19 in the wastewater there in was, Christchurch? There was one... Yeah, it, there, there was one instance of COVID being detected in the wastewater, but they think it was probably uh, a person who came into the country infected and had been released from quarantine, and there might have just been some residual virus in their system or something. So I don't know. I imagine that they'll be checking again, and if it shows up again, that will probably be cause for concern. But I think um, that just that one thing can probably be uh, accounted for. But anyway, we're still very much at the wait and see point. Um, but yes, once again, to all the people who said, what, what are they thinking? Locking down after a single case. Well, now there's like 200 of them. And there always was before we even locked down. It's just we didn't know about them. There was just that the one that showed us it was out in the community. But anyway, um, enough, enough, enough COVID talk. I think everyone's had enough of COVID talk. I think, so, I think um, people had enough of COVID talk around about a year ago. Yes, no, definitely. Uh, so it's uh, another What the Conspiracy episode, and it's my turn in the driving seat, in the, in the hot seat. In the, the, uh, we, I, we, did, we never did quite work out if I'm the one in the chair, meaning that I'm the, the one being grilled like it's an episode of Mastermind and you're the host or if it's the other way around. But it doesn't matter because it's not Mastermind. It's What the Conspiracy, and I'm going to be introducing in to a conspiracy that I'm hoping you haven't heard of, but again, who knows? Who knows? Well, precisely. I mean, I am the expert in the field. So well, exactly. There's always yeah. the possibility you'll go, what the conspiracy? And I'll go, no, what the conspiracy, Josh? What the conspiracy? Try to pull one over on me. Mm. What the conspiracy, Josh? Right. Well, I said that, good Steve. day, sir. Yes. I said play good day. Play good day. Play that. Good, good day. I said good day. It's time to play What the Conspiracy. So, have I got a conspiracy for you? Yes, is the answer to that question. But um, I guess we should do the traditional thing and get you to give me your best, best shot at uh, where, when, and what this conspiracy concerns? Hmm. Where? I don't think you've done a local conspiracy recently, although I think you're going to think that if you go local and we go local Aotearoa New Zealand, then I'm going to know what's what. So I think you're going to go local, but you're going to go local Australasia and the Pacific. Now, I'm going mm -hmm. to, I'm, I'm assuming... And this is a problematic assumption for a bunch of reasons, but I'm assuming there are probably more conspiracies in Australia than there are in Australasia and the 
and the well, I mean, actually, by definition, there must be if there's going to be Australia in the Pacific as a G salt, and given that Australia is the biggest part, it's got to be the case Australia has the majority of them. But I'm going Australia, mm -hmm. and possibly really going out here. I'm going to go for New South Wales. Right. Yep. So New South Wales. Okay, the, time the time period, I think, is going to need to be the 20th century, although maybe you might hedge your bets and go into the either the 20, early 21st or late 19th, but I'm going 20th century. And mm -hmm. the kind of conspiracy is missing prime minister conspiracy theories. I think you're going to try and, and pull one over with me with a missing prime minister from Australia, and I'm telling you he went for a swim and he didn't come back. Right. Well, your, your, your reasoning is impeccable. Your conclusions are so-so. Uh, um, the 20th century, 1980s, in fact. Oh, uh, one of the worst decades and mm, also one of the best decades. It had its high points and low points, yes. Uh, and we're going to talk about one of the lows. Um, it takes place in the Republic of Ireland and actually that's, Northern Ireland a little bit as well. That's, that's, not, that's not Australia, That's though. not Australia. That is I mean, it's also the... not New South Wales. I mean, if you'd... I mean, if it had been Wales, that would have been yeah, amazing. You would have been close, but no, you're yeah. British Isles. But yeah, that's as close as you go. Well, I suppose. I mean, I suppose the Republic is actually quite close to Wales. It, it's so close, geographically, yeah. actually, I'm I'm a lot closer than you might think because Wales, you know, they've got they've got a sea border with the Republic of that's Ireland. True. So, frankly, actually, and I think Wales I think, is part of New South Wales. Yep. I'll, yeah. I'll give you a third, maybe a half, half marks on that one. Far too generous. Far too um, generous. And in terms of the um, of the topic, it is about it is about something going missing, uh, but that something was not a famous prime minister. We're talking. I want to talk to you about a kidnapping, uh, but no ordinary kidnapping. A horse kidnapping. Hmm. Today, I wish to tell you the tale of the kidnapping of Shergar, subtitle, Thank You for Your Horse Brutality. Um, this sorry, no, 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 sorry, no, no, wait, wait, wait. So, please, please do that joke oh, do, again. Do I need to do it again? Yeah. I'm going to tell you the tale of the kidnapping of Shergar, subtitle, Thank You for Your Horse Brutality. Well deserved. Now, it was interesting, actually. I, I basically, uh, last week, thought, okay, I need to come up with a topic, did a bit of Googling on what, what are some obscure conspiracy theories. This one came up, so I started doing a bit of reading. I thought, oh, yeah, this looks good. And then in reading about this topic, I discovered that there has actually been a podcast on this very topic uh, released just this year, just a few months ago. Um, it is a topic, a, a podcast by the BBC called Sports Strangest Crimes, about a kidnapping of a horse in Ireland. Now, my challenge to you, without doing any surreptitious Googling, is to tell me who do you think they got to narrate this BBC podcast about the kidnapping of an Irish horse? Oh, is it going to be... Oh, actually, now no, I've now forgotten. Is it... So I'm going to go with the obvious option the BBC always goes for, which is Stephen Fry. No, but at no, the same nothing. time, I'm also going to go for the obvious reference to last week, Sean Locke. Mm. Uh, no, no, I we'll come back to this. As long as you promise not to Google it while I'm talking. Is it um, Ardale, and I can't remember how his last name goes, uh, Dougal from Hanlon? Father Ted? No it's, no, it's not him either, I'm afraid. No, no, Is it it's... what's his name from Black Box? I'm going to place money on the fact that you won't get this answer unless you've been surreptitiously Googling. Right. And if you Is do it get it right, I'm just... Queen Elizabeth II. Can you go for a no, big punt here? No, no, actually, no, bigger punt. No, Pope bigger. Francis. You'd need a bigger punt, I'm afraid. Pope Francis. No, no. Okay, now we'll come back to... I'll, I'll, we'll come George back to George W. Bush. No. Okay, Donald so, Trump. No. Horse racing. Horse racing, I don't know a lot about horse racing or the country of Ireland, but apparently horse racing is quite big in Ireland, or at least it certainly was in the 1980s. Um, and obviously in the 1980s, Ireland was not in a great place. You know, either the troubles were in full swing, the economy was not doing particularly well. Um, and so a champion racehorse like the one we're about to talk about was, was kind of a figure of national pride. And so this became this, this whole affair became quite a big deal. So the horse in question is called Shergar. 
He uh, was born in 1978 in County Kildare in one Ireland. Quick yes. Question. So, what D and D class is Shirgar? Because it certainly sounds like a a random monster name that's been generated from it does a from a table. Bit. I don't was know. Shirgar the Magnificent. Just about, yeah. So remember, actually, no, you won't remember, but our listeners will remember a few what the conspiracies ago when I talked about Patrick Ewing um, and how, how talented and sought after he was. Shergar was basically the Patrick Ewing of racehorses. Or in fact, since, I mean, this was this was happening around the time Patrick Ewing was probably just getting started in his basketball career. So it'd probably be more accurate to say Patrick Ewing was the Shergar of basketball players. Or indeed, since they're around at the same time, and I never saw photographs of the two of them together, it's entirely possible Patrick Ewing was Shergar the racehorse, but I don't think that's ever been proved. So we'll we'll move on. Um, Shergar started racing in 1980 when he had uh, uh, some very strong performances but really hit his stride, uh, literally and figuratively, in 1981, uh, winning, among other things, the Guardian Classic Trial, the Chester Vars, the Epsom Derby, the Irish Derby, and the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth Stakes. Um, he Sorry, was... uh, out of curiosity, were those stakes, were they, were they Chevalier stakes by any chance? Uh, no, it's S T A A K E S. Unfortunately. Also, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm just going to add this in for my own pleasure. Fair enough. Well done. Um, so he was apparently he, he was known for being um, not just a great racehorse, a, a, a great a fast running horse, but he was also apparently uh, very very even tempered and very easy to work with. He sort of you know he he had everything basically. He he was great to race, but also great to train and work with and handle and so on. They had sort of school children could come and visit and would be allowed to pet him. Apparently one time he uh, got out of his stables and just went for a wander around the local town until somebody caught up with him and just happily walked him back and it was you know fine. He was just a a, a great horse apparently. Uh, and of course, he was a very, very valuable horse. Um, he was owned by the Aga Khan, which is the title, uh, a title given to the imam of one of the major denominations of Shia Islam, uh, who then and now uh, was Prince Shah Karim al Husseini. Now, I'm aware I just said the word Khan, and I'm going to be saying it a lot this episode. So off you go, get it out of your system. Very good. Um, so after his win at the Epsom Derby in 1981, the Aga Khan sold shares in Shergar. Uh, Shergar was valued at £10 million, and that's £10 million in 1981, so I don't know how much it would be worth these days, but a fair bit more. Um, so there were 40 shares, so that's £250,000 apiece. The Aga Khan kept six, and he and the owners of the other 34 formed an owner's syndicate, um, to, to make money off Shergar and make money they did. So um, he, he, he did, did phenomenally well for most of 1981, but towards the end of the racing season, his performance started to drop. And after he came in, I think a, a, a mere fourth at the Prix du Lac de Triomphe race, uh, late in 1981, the Aga Khan decided rather than uh, investing, putting more resources into training him up and, and possibly getting him back on form or possibly not, they'd just put him out to stud at the Ballymany Stud Farm in Ireland. And I gather, again, don't know much about racing, but I gather the real money from a champion racehorse is not from, like, prize money from winning races. It's, it's from putting them out to stud. It is, it basically, yeah. It's putting them out to stud, and horse breeders from all around the world will want the opportunity to to have this horse sire their next generation of racehorses. Um, so yes, he was put out to stud in Ireland. This was apparently a, a bit of a, a point of pride for Ireland. Supposedly, the Aga Khan had been offered quite a lot of money to uh, take Shergar to America for the horse breeders over there, but he decided to stay in Ireland. Um, Ireland's much more lax tax laws may have had something to do with that, but but this was a big deal. There was apparently a parade in County Kildare when when um, Shergar was brought home. They paraded him down the streets, um, and and he he got to got to work. He got down to business. Did this horse? Um, Stud fees for him could be as high as eighty thousand um, pounds. In 1982, he what's the word? Serviced. 
44 mares, siring about 36 foals. He was booked for another 55 mares in the, for the 1983 breeding season. It's a lot of, lot of horse loving right there. Which a lot was of horse semen. To, it's a lot mm-hmm. of horse semen. Expected to make over a million pounds uh, for, the, for the syndicate. Unfortunately, at around 8.30 p.m., on the night of February the 8th, 1983, not long before the breeding season, the stud season was about to begin, he was kidnapped. On that night, three masked armed men burst into the home of a man called Jim Fitzgerald, who was the head groom at the Ballymamy stud farm. Um, so held at gunpoint, one of them said, we have come for Shergar, we want two million pounds for him. And so Mr. Fitzgerald's family was locked in a room and he was taken to the stables at gunpoint where the rest of the kidnappers were waiting. Apparently there were, he reckoned there were between six and nine men altogether. Obviously he wasn't in an in a entirely reliable state of mind, bit of a state of shock, but that was, that was his guess. Um, and he was ordered to put Shurgar into a horse float so they could take him away. And unfortunately, um, Shurgar's easygoing nature kind of worked against him in this case because he basically went, you know, went without any trouble. He was a he was a, a fairly chilled out horse who was happy to just jump on this float, even if it, even though it was a bunch of strangers getting on there. And, and away he went. So one lot of one lot of this group drove Shurgar off. Meanwhile, Fitzgerald was taken off in a van. Um, made to lie face down so he couldn't see where they were going and was basically just dro- driven around for a good wee while just to, to stall, basically, so that he wouldn't be able to raise any alarm. Um, drove him around for a while and then dropped him off at a village around 20 miles away from Valley Manny. Uh, the killers, when they dropped him off, told him not to contact the police or he and his family would be killed. And they told him that the gang would contact him using the phrase King Neptune to identify themselves. Now, as far as we're aware, King Neptune himself, a.k.a. Poseidon, the Lord of the Deep, was not involved in the killings in any way. But we can't be sure. Actually, we can be sure because the Emperor Caligula had a decisive victory against Neptune during his reign. And Neptune has not troubled the world since. Okay, well, well, there we go then. You've heard it here first. Um, so once Phil Fitzgerald managed to get back to Ballymany, apparently he sort of had to walk to the next town. Again, remembering this is 1981. <clears throat> so um, after this would have been, I don't know, 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, nothing, nothing would be open. Um, he walked to another town, managed to ring his brother, who gave him a lift back to Ballymany. And at that point... He didn't really know what to do. This was, you know, he, th- this is not a situation he'd ever prepared himself for. It wasn't something he'd ever, a possibility he'd ever considered. So his first thing was, well, I really feel like I should call the police or certainly, you know, tell some people, but they, they told me I shouldn't. So what do I do? So then this um, big, big game of phone tag basically commenced. Um, Jim Fitzgerald first called a Frenchman by the name of Gilan Drion who was the manager of the Aga Khan's studs in Ireland. Drion tried to get in touch with the Aga Khan, but couldn't. So he called a man called Stan Cosgrove, who was Shugar's vet and uh, also one of the shareholders in the syndicate. And we'll come back to Mr. Cosgrove later. Um, but Mr. Cosgrove then called Sean Berry, the manager of the Irish Thoroughbred Breeders Association. Sean Berry called his friend Alan Dukes, who was the Minister of Finance. Alan Dukes referred him to Michael Noonan, who was the Minister for Justice. Um, and both both Ellen Dukes and Michael Noonan, both ministers, said, yeah, you should definitely call the cops. And um, around four o'clock in the morning local time, uh, Mr. Drion, who had been trying to get in touch with the Aga Khan all that time, presumably, finally did manage to get in contact with him, told him what had gone on, Shugar had been stolen, and the Aga Khan instructed them, yes, no, definitely call the police, call them right away. But by this time like more than eight hours had passed since the actual kidnapping. So the trail had, had gone fairly cold um, and the police police had a lot of, d- d- didn't really have a lot to go on. And to complicate matters, and presumably this was something that the kidnappers knew and, 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 and this was the reason for their timing, um, there had just been a, a big thoroughbred, an auction of thoroughbred horses in the area. So it wasn't wasn't as simple as saying, you know, look out for some people towing a horse float because there were lots of horses being transported around the area at that time. Um, so, so to begin with, they'd taken the horse and they'd basically um, seemed like they'd gotten away with it, initially at least. 
Um, so so let's, let's take a pause there. Uh, having heard a bit more about the case, who do you think they might have got to narrate a podcast about this on the BBC? Give me another guess. Well, see, I mean, I've really punted big with Pope Francis, Donald mm. J. Trump, George W. Bush, and the Queen of England. So... I mean, I'm going to say it, it may be the person you least would expect to host a, a, a British podcast about the kidnapping of an Irish horse. Well, I mean, if we're talking about the person I would least expect to host a podcast about strange British sporting crimes, I'm going to go, is it me? Am I the host of the podcast? That, it's a better guess than the previous ones, but no, unfortunately, you're wrong. So let's move on. Um, so the, the horse had been kidnapped, but kidnapped for ransom. And so obviously then came the ransom demands. Now, apparently the syndicate had decided pretty much early on they weren't going to pay the ransom. Um, they were basically afraid that if they did, that would set a precedent. And obviously, you know, if, you, if you're rich enough to, to drop £250,000 in shares on a, on a racehorse, you're probably rich enough that you actually own a lot of horses. And certainly the Aga Khan did, and I imagine a bunch of the other people did as well. So they didn't want to um, basically paint a target on any of their other valuable horses if, if this, you know, if, if it was shown that kidnapping a racehorse was a, a way to make a lot of money. Uh, and of course, they were also insured. And I mean, don't forget that for the... Uh, for the syndicate, you know, th th this is an investment. They're, they're in it for the money. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many, how much, if any of them, had much of a sentimental attachment to the horse. And of course, they were all insured. Although some apparently, sort of, I, th I think they were all insured in the case of Shergar's death. Although not all of them had think, thought to take out um, insurance in case he was stolen. But anyway. Um, so as for the ransom demand, straight away a horse trainer, I believe, located in Belfast which is, is fairly far from County Kildare and also in Northern Ireland, not the Republic of Ireland. Um, he was kidnapped, uh, he was kidnapped, he was contacted by the kidnappers, who at that point were asking for apparently four, only 40,000 pounds, although they later raised that to 52,000. Um, and, and they told him that they would only deal with these three certain uh, British horse racing journalists. They wanted them to be, you know, sort of neutral third parties, but who knew, knew what they were talking about when it came to horses. Um, and so all these men were told to meet at a particular hotel in Belfast. And from there, they were all told to go back to Jeremy Maxwell's house and wait for the kidnappers to call. And call they did. Over the, over the next few days, they called a bunch of times. Um, and being the 1980s, it was the, it was the good old-fashioned keep them talking for as long as you can so we can trace the phone call situation. But unfortunately, that never happened. Um, there was apparently only one time where the kidnappers stayed on the line long enough for a call, for a trace to be run. But unfortunately, the person who was supposed to be running the trace had gone home because their shift had ended. Um, and so that never happened. Now, at the same time as Jeremy Maxwell and, and these reporters were dealing with kidnappers, a whole second sort of line of negotiation, a second sort of stream was going on in, in parallel. Um, on the afternoon of the 9th of February, so that's the day after the kidnapping, um, the kidnappers got in touch with uh, Gilles Andrion himself. And the, the, apparently things got a little bit farcical at this point because Mr. Drion uh, was a Frenchman whose, whose English was not spectacular. And between his poor grasp of English, his heavy French accent, and the kidnappers' heavy Irish accent, they could barely actually understand each other. And I gather the kidnappers had to basically gave up, gave up at one point and had to ring back a bit later. And apparently speaking very slowly and clearly, were able to establish that they were after £2 million and they wanted a contact number in France because they wanted to, to do all the negotiations through France. Again, like neutral territory, may, may, may harder to investigate for the police if it's in another country. I don't know. But they wanted to, they wanted to talk to people in France for their, for their negotiations. And over the next four days, the owner syndicate negotiated with the kidnappers through a, a third party sort of consulting firm that the syndicate had brought in, um, acting out of the Aga Khan's office in France. Now, you may be thinking at this point, why, what's going on? Why were there two different lanes of negotiations going on? Well, some people thought that the first lot was a hoax. Some people thought the whole the, all, Jeremy Maxwell and this business in Belfast was just someone else trying to trick other people out of the ransom money and, and who actually had nothing to do with the kidnapping. But... 
The problem with that is that apparently these these people who called Jeremy Maxwell had used the King Neptune code phrase. Um, but more than that, the first call that they placed to Jeremy Maxwell was um, on. Uh, it must have been on the night of the 8th because it was actually that they, they got in touch with him before Jim Fitzgerald had got back to Belly Manny and been able to tell anyone about the, 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 the kidnapping in the first place. So it does seem they were genuine. And so people then thought, well, perhaps the whole, it was all just a distraction that this was, these were fake negotiations, but the whole point of it was to get the media and the police looking at what's going on in Belfast, what's happening in this hotel, what, you know, what's going on in a completely different part of the country to make it easier to, A, move Shurgar around to whatever safe house they had him at and, and throw them off the scent of the, um, of the real uh, negotiations. That would suggest it, a fairly complicated plot then. Mm, because if your plot is not just, we've kidnapped the horse and we want a ransom, but we also have a cover story so that people will be investigating a kidnapping plot in one location, whilst we actually do our negotiations and our transfer in a completely different location. That suggests a very, very organised conspiracy. Mm. Yes, well, I mean, this was a very valuable horse owned by some very rich and presumably powerful oh, Josh, and well-connected we, we, people. We have already established it's a very valuable vessel of horse semen. Yes, a very, very valuable semen delivery system. Or at least, actually, no, no, not just delivery system, a production system. Production site, yes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, certainly the, the second lot of negotiations did appear to be the legitimate one. This was the, this was the, the, real, the real ransom demands. Um, but they did not go particularly well either. Um, for one thing, the, the kidnappers seemed to, going by how they spoke, they seemed to think that Shergar was owned solely by the Aga Khan. They didn't, to begin with, realise that he was actually owned by a syndicate of people, and that so therefore they were dealing with a whole bunch of people who all needed to have a say and who needed to, to, to confer and agree on things and so on, so that complicated business. They also, some of their demands were, were just... Um, impossible essentially that they would say things like you know uh, talking to people in the evening say okay you need to get two million pounds and you need to have it all together by the end of the night not seemingly not realizing that at the time they were calling all the banks in France were already shut and there was literally no way of getting two million pounds together by the end of the night things like that uh, which has led people to think some people thought again maybe this was another more, more sowing more confusion, or that maybe it wasn't about publicity and these it wasn't about money and these people were after publicity or something. But it, it does kind of seem like they were, for, for all the sophistication of it, they didn't quite know what they were doing when it came to the negotiation side of things. And um, sure enough, the negotiations eventually broke down, uh, as they were basically bound to, since, as I said, the, the syndicate had basically decided um, they weren't going to pay out. And so I, I, I imagine were probably just trying to draw out negotiations as long as they could, uh, in the hope that the police would be able to hunt them down and get the horse back or something. But So they, the syndicate started demanding proof of life from the kidnappers. On February the 12th, um, the kidnappers directed them to where they could find uh, some Polaroids showing Shergar's face next Sorry, to were the, these, the old... were these Polaroids showing Shergar in compromising positions? Unfortunately, no. Shergar was a stud horse. If you wanted compromising photos of him in a compromising position, it probably happened daily throughout the breeding season. Um, no, it was the good old holding up a newspaper with today's date, or I think yesterday's date technically, uh, next to a picture of him. Um, but the syndicate weren't, weren't satisfied with that because all you could see in the photo was his head, and they wanted to say, no, we want proof that he's actually alive in one piece, not injured in any way. And they sort of went back and forth. And on the evening of February the 12th, the kidnappers possibly just getting fed up with them or possibly finally twigging to the fact that these guys weren't going to pay out, basically said, well, you know, if that's not good, no good enough with you, then to hell with you, hung up and never never called back. Um, and then apparently also on February the 12th, there was a call placed to Jeremy Maxwell, the guy from the other line of negotiations, claiming that things had gone wrong and the horse was dead, but that was never, uh, that was never substantiated. Now, 
that was when negotiations broke down and 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 the trail went dead and that was almost the end of it except 8 weeks later remember remember i mentioned stan cosgrove the the vet of shergar and one of the shareholders um, eight weeks after the kidnapping, he was contacted by the police and introduced to a man called Dennis Minogue, who said he had contacts in the IRA and would be able to arrange for the release of Shergar for only £80,000. And Stan Cosgrove was apparently quite desperate. He was one of the people who didn't have theft insurance on Shergar and so was looking to be quite out of pocket. And um, and also he was he was... An Irishman, so I assume was quite actually attached to Shergar, and so in between his desperation and possibly, you know, po- possibly had ideas of of being the hero who finally managed to get Shergar back. He went along with the scheme, uh, took eighty thousand pounds of his own money, gave it to uh, a detective. The detective locked the money in the boot of his car or trunk, if you're American. Um, with the idea that that Minogue would arrange for the release of Shergar. Once Shergar had been got back, the detective would then hand over the money to Minogue. What actually happened was that night somebody broke into the detective's car, stole the money, and Dennis Minogue was never heard from again. So that seemed to be very much just an opportunistic scam, um, like people had suggested the, the other one was. Um, and so that's basically all we know about the Shergar kidnapping. So my, now might be another good time to have a break and ask, who do you think the BBC got to narrate a podcast about the kidnapping and disappearance of this famous Irish horse? Was it Boris Johnson? It was not Boris Johnson. Right. Further was it afield. Ex- well, so I think say, was it ex-Prime Minister David Cameron? It was not. I can tell you it right. was not an ex-Prime right. Minister. So Right. So, so what about the what about the current president of France, Emmanuel Macron? I can tell you, I can rule out the entire country of France. No Frenchman. Angela yeah. Merkel. Not Angela Merkel. No. Uh, Victor Orban. No, no world, not a world leader. What about a a, a minor despot? Uh, no, I'm going to say no. Is it the ghost you... of Charlie Chaplin? It is not the ghost of Charlie Chaplin, but you're getting a little bit closer. Now, I'll, I'll let you think about right. that. Was it Eddie Izzard who played was not, Chaplin in The Cat's Meow, a topic which Eddie we have to do at some point? Yeah, we do, actually. Yes, no, I'm afraid it wasn't. So, moving on. So, the question became, of course, who was behind the kidnapping? Um, now, obviously, the media was following this case fairly breathlessly, but once the case went cold and the police had no leads for the media to report. Apparently, the the, the first police officer they had fronting the investigation was a bit of a character, um, and but was quite upfront about the fact that they had no idea and no leads on. So, no Josh, at all. were you saying that the person leading the investigation was horsing around? A little bit, yes. Uh, he eventually got, got replaced, I think. But anyway, the point is that once the... Um, Sorry, once are you the... saying that he got sent to the glue factory... You could say that, yes. Um, and after that happened, and once the media had no official leads or, or anything to report on, they started basically publishing a lot of speculation and people's theories about what had gone on. Gone on. Um, some people thought a, a Middle Eastern horse owner had stolen Shergar for his own his own breeding purposes. Um, some pe- people reckon theorised a link to the mafia, the mafia in New Orleans specifically. Supposedly, someone came up with a link there and suggested that they had kidnapped Shergar as revenge against the Aga Khan for another horse sale that had gone bad in the past or something. Uh, Some people suggested Colonel Gaddafi, who was not the narrator of the BBC podcast, just to cut you off there. Colonel Gaddafi may have been... I was never going to guess him as the narrator because he's dead. Well, that didn't stop you with the ghost of Charlie Chaplin. Um... Suggested that maybe Colonel Gaddafi it was some sort of a part of a part of an arms deal with the IRA. Shergar was something he had, uh, he wanted in exchange for arms, but uh, none of those I don't think were seriously entertained. The IRA though uh, were right from the start and have remained to this day the main suspects. Um, the IRA were in need of a lot of money. Apparently, the whole you know the, the whole thing they did of of going for political power via Sinn Féin, plus being the IRA and all the the, the violence and the what have you, uh, was fairly expensive. Political campaigns cost money, and so do guns and bullets and bombs. 
Um, and so £2 million ransom would have, would have been very helpful for them. But uh, obviously they have denied everything and nothing ever came of that. But in 1999, a man called Sean O'Callaghan, who was a former IRA member who'd been, who, who later turned informant for the police, published his autobiography. And in that, he said that the IRA were behind the kidnapping, uh, naming a man called Kevin Mellon. Was it be Kevin Malone? Do you pronounce it Malone if there's no E on the end? I don't know. I don't, don't know my Irish names, unfortunately. I'll say Kevin Malone because it sounds nicer. Who was <clears throat> a high-ranking member of the IRA, a bit of a, a, bit of a, uh, a notorious figure himself, apparently. He had a couple of quite high-profile escapes from, from prisons in, in the past, but they said that um, he had come up with this idea in prison and he was the one who put the whole plan together. Um, now, according to O'Callaghan, Shergar was killed within days of being kidnapped um, and but the IRA kept up the pretense that they still had him alive to try and still get the ransom money. Um, so the story that O'Callaghan heard, he doesn't claim to have been involved in it, but had heard through his IRA channels, that what happened was um, fairly early on, they, were, they weren't able to control Shergar. He might have been easygoing, but there are limits. Um, and eventually Shergar sort of went a bit a bit wild and injured himself, and they ended up having to euthanize him. Um, and according to him, the operation had uh, three teams. One team were uh, responsible for guarding Shergar. There was another group of people negotiating with the Aga Khan, and a third group who were indeed responsible for the uh, negotiating happening up in Belfast, which was, as some people had suspected, all just a distraction to keep attention away from what was really going on. Um, this is all very plausible, but we only have Mr. O'Callaghan's word for it. Uh, there's no actual evidence behind this, and obviously anyone, any, the people who he claimed were involved have all flat out denied it. Um, then a little bit later in 2008, the Sunday Telegraph newspaper published information from what they called an impeccable source. This was an anonymous IRA member who claimed to have been a close friend of one of the kidnappers, who, speaking to the Telegraph through an intermediary, said that while the kidnapping of Shergar was an IRA plan with Kevin Malone at its head, um, O'Callaghan hadn't been given the whole story. So supposedly the real story is, uh, the first de first interesting detail was that the IRA had arranged for a vet to look after Shergar while they were holding him, but this vet told his wife what he was going to do, and she told him that if he went through with it, she would leave him, and so he bailed out and they had no vet. Um, but nevertheless, Shergar was not out of control. His, his easy temperament uh, remained intact. He didn't injure himself. Um, and in fact, once the kidnappers had realized that the syndicate wasn't going to pay up, they decided to cut their losses and just release him. But unfortunately, by that stage, the country was swarming with police. Look, they were looking everywhere for him. Um, Kevin Malone himself was, as far as he was aware, under very close surveillance. And so it was just they, they couldn't see a safe way of releasing Shergar without getting caught um, either leaving the place where they were holding him or being caught on the road somewhere and it all getting back to, you know, the, the whole point was they wanted to um, they wanted to be able to deny all knowledge of it and not have it traced back to them. Uh, and so, so Mellon decided that uh, because they, there wasn't a safe way for them to release Shergar, the only thing they could do was kill him and hide the body. Um, and so according to, the, according to this IRA source, uh, the quote was, Shergar was machine gunned to death. There was blood everywhere and the horse even slipped on his own blood. There was lots of cussing and swearing because the horse wouldn't die. It was a very bloody death. Because unfortunately to slaughter a horse humanely, you kind of need to be a vet with the right equipment, not a couple of IRA guys with machine guns. And so the story goes that this gentle and beloved animal unfortunately suffered quite a, a horrible, brutal death. Um, the, the only upside to which is it, it justified the horse brut brutality pun at the start of this episode. So I don't know if it not does it. justify that, Doesn't? that pun. No. Well, I mean, it was if, 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 it, if it had just, if they'd let him go at the end. Anyway, um, 
So this source did not know where Shergar was buried, and apparently over time there have been, you know, occasionally people will find the, the, the skull of a horse or something and wonder, oh, maybe I found Shergar's body, but they, they still they had, like, you know, his, his hair and presumably other DNA remains of him, uh, but they've, they've never, it's never been found. Um, and so, yeah, once again, this is the story that's come out, but the IRA and everyone named have always denied responsibility. No arrests have ever been made because there's never been any actual evidence. Um, according to the, the Sunday Telegraph informant, the IRA were actually kind of embarrassed that the operation had gone so wrong, which is why even amongst themselves, the story they spread, which is the story that O'Callaghan had heard, what wasn't you know wasn't actually what really happened because what really happened was was worse and made them made them look even worse um and i think they also underestimated a little bit just how much the irish public cared about shergar and his fate so it, you know it would have been very bad pr for the ira were it to be shown conclusively that they were behind the bloody death of this nation's beloved horse um and in fact as it was even um even without any sort of proof or anything, at the time, the police were raiding IRA safe houses all over the country, looking for um, proof, you know, evidence of where he might be or trying to find out. So the IRA did lose a bunch of arms, caches and things like that to these raids. But um, Shergar's body's never been found. It's assumed you know, they probably dropped in a bog somewhere in Ireland. Um, and in that part of the world, the case has just joined the the canon of of um, famous unsolved mysteries. Apparently, even at the time, people made jokes about um, Shergar was last seen being ridden by Lord Lucan, who we did do an episode about very, very uh, early on in this podcast's run. I think it was one of our, our very first ones on famous disappearances. But um, that's the story of the kidnapping of Shergar. So now... We've come to the end. With everything you've heard today, what is your guess for the person who the BBC got to narrate the podcast about the kidnapping of an Irish horse possibly meeting a sticky end at the hands of the IRA? Was it one of Shergar's offspring? It was not a horse. Well then, my only... Final guess is there should be kind of a drum roll here, which is actually just me vamping because I've really got no idea whatsoever. My final guess is going to be Horace Walpole. No, the person. If if you if you go, it's just, this is not a lie. This is uh, God's honest truth. If you were to go onto the podcasting medium of your choice and look up Sports Strangest Crimes, you will find that this podcast series is narrated by Vanilla Ice. The, yeah, there the was obvious... no way I was ever going <laughs> to get no that. There was no way you were going to get that. Um, I listened, I didn't actually, it's a, a seven part podcast series on the kidnapping of Shergar. The fact that it's called Sports Strangest Crimes leads me to suspect that there will be other series about other sporting crimes, but this seems to be the first. Uh, it's not very good, I have to say. I listened to it a bit. It's one of those ones that's quite. Um, I don't know if you call it overproduced or something like every every sentence is punctuated with the sound effect or a, a snippet of music or something, uh, a very on the nose bit of of sound uh, sound engineering to the extent that um, in one of the later episodes when they're talking about the police investigation and how they eventually were consulting psychics and and remote viewers, they introduced that sentence with a snatch of superstition by Stevie Wonder. Just because. Um, I mean, it's, it's a good song. It's a good song, but but yeah, a little bit on the nose, I thought. But yeah, I mean, it's it, it really. I didn't listen to the whole lot because it just drew the whole damn thing out so much. By you'd sort of get one sentence from Vanilla Ice, then then a sound clip, then a sound effect, then a bit of music. It just yeah, I, I I don't know that I can recommend it. But it probably if you if you did have the patience to listen to the whole thing, it would probably contain more uh, information than this one podcast episode here but um or you're a fan of vanilla ice which or i suppose they might, i mean obviously someone at the bbc is a fan mm. of vanilla ice because i can only assume that's the rationale as to why they were what we need is a famous person to narrate a podcast 
there's no one more famous than Vanilla Ice. And other people go, Vanilla who? You know, Vanilla mm. Ice, pretty big in the, in the 80s. It's a, for what? Well, no one's entirely sure what mm. he was famous for, but he, he was did, famous. did one very successful song that ripped off Queen, uh, and then he disappeared to start his movie career. Unfortunately, two years later, once the movie he decided to make was released, no one remembered who the hell he was, I think. Is and then he became a punchline in The Critic. He did. Uh, and then, then uh, but keeps, uh, continues rapping under the name Rob Van Winkle. Did some celebrity boxing as well, and apparently has a house renovating show or something like that. I think, I I think talks, almost every 80s I and think 90s they do. celebrity mm. in the US has some kind of, you know, a burger making show, a house renovation show, a, I became an undertaker, this is how I embalm a corpse show. Mm. But there you have it, the story of Shergar. It's, I, I assume, is horse racing enough of a sport that you're going to force yourself to forget all of this as well? Or does it well, things, I, really I actually have a, a bit of, I have a bit of sympathy to the old GGs because my, mm. my grandfather was really big on betting mm, on so the horses. mine, actually, and, yeah. And I remember sitting at his knee, his copy of Best Bets in his hand, and his asking, you know, do you want to place a bet? And I would, I would go to Best Bets, and I would look at who was likely to win the race, because they always have the first, second, and third likely winners. And as a five-year-old, I would choose, well, obviously put my money on the first place winner. I mean, why wouldn't you? And my grandfather trying to explain to me how, how odds work. And my, as a five-year-old, not understanding anything about numbers, arguably, I don't understand anything about numbers now. But at five, I was even worse. And insisting we put the money on, on the first place of a call into best bets. So there's a bit of me that's actually... Mm. So, and my mum talks about how her parents' generation, they went into owning a horse, which is located down mm. in Frankton. So there's a bit of horse racing in the family. Oh, so well, I go. will remember the story, even though this Charles Ewing basketball thing that you mentioned earlier on rings no bells whatsoever. No, no, I didn't imagine it would. Um. So there you go. That is the end of the episode for you, but not for you if you I'm referring to is one of our patrons, because of course we have a bonus episode coming up after this. What are we going to be talking about there? Well, we've got some updates on those lockdown protests that have been going on across the country. A mysterious group of people meeting in a mysterious location, talking about mysterious things, which is they even more mysterious, mysterious people. because the people who research these mysterious people have no idea about these mysterious people. We'll probably make a joke about how Hobby Lobby is probably going to be indicted once again for trading in terrorist antiquities. A horrible story about the NZSIS, and then, of course, an update on that old Havana sound. Hmm. So if you're interested in hearing all of those, and you are not currently a patron, you can become one at uh, patreon.com by searching for the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy and signing up. If you are a patron, good news! You get it anyway, but you probably already know that because you're already a patron. Uh, and if you're not a patron and you don't want to be one, well, thank you for listening to our story uh, of, of the kidnapping and death of a beloved horse. And I, I hope, if you're an animal lover, this did not traumatize you too much. And if you happen to be someone who was involved in the kidnapping of Sugar, please do get in contact so that we can reveal that to the world. Mm. But until then, I think it simply remains for me to say goodbye. And for me to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost made a horse noise myself, but chose not to. Now I must talk with the dolphins. <laughs>been listening to the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy starring josh addison and dr mrx dentit which is written research recorded and produced by josh and m you can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its podbean or patreon campaigns and if you need to get in contact with either josh or m you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their twitter accounts monkey fluids and conspiracism
And remember, it's just a step to the left.